Good morning. My name is Jack Dorsey, and we are joining you live from Twitter headquarters in San Francisco. And we are here with some of the cast and the director of The Circle. We're going to have a discussion around technology, around data, uh, privacy, uh, and also diversity in technology as well. And it's going to be fun. And it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Awesome. Be fun. Awesome. I'm live tweeting it if you want to go to my Twitter feed. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hang on, Tom just said it's going to be fun. Be fun. Yeah. Send. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So join me in welcoming James, Emma, Tom, and Patton. Hi. Thanks, Jack. So we, should we kick it off with uh, Emma's experience of, of making this movie? Sure. You know, I was a big fan of Dave Eggers, uh, who wrote uh, The Circle, and I remember reading the script, and it was just something that really stayed with me and got under my skin and started kind of haunting me a little bit. I remember speaking to James and I had a very long Skype conversation, and then I was like, I, I have to talk to Dave, I have to try to, you know, like, and I realized what an amazing piece of material it was because you just, it poses endless questions and it really makes you think about things that perhaps you haven't spent time thinking about before. And um, I knew I had to do the project because it just, it wouldn't leave me. You know, it just, it, yeah, it, it wouldn't leave me. It was, uh, so yeah, working with James has been wonderful and working with Tom has been terrible. People hate him <laughs> and, um, it's just really hard work. <coughs> Pat is not funny ever. Um, so it's yes. been bad. Um, but uh, I think we managed to make a good final end product. So I'm pleased at least with that. And James, what about your experience? Uh, it was great. I mean, it began for me with reading Dave's novel. I've been a fan of Dave's writing since his first book, Heartbreaking Work of Staggering Genius. And um, yeah, I was excited to read The Circle. I think I read it in two days. And I was uh, found it hilarious, darkly hilarious. And I was, um, I was really upset by it <laughs> um, because, um, I mean, May um, Holland, the main character that Emma plays, I, I think I, I saw myself in her for better or worse, probably for worse. There was something, I think she was very idealistic. Mm. Um, and then there was a part of her that just desperately wanted to be seen and known. And um, there was, a, I think, a, a loneliness and emptiness in her gut that she was working, working through. And, um, you know, for, for myself, I mean, my wife and I were about to have a kid when I read Dave's book, and we just started talking a lot about our own childhoods um, and how we had been able to sort of live, for the most part, un unsurveilled lives, you know? Like, we, there wasn't a, a, a record of what we'd done. We made mistakes in private. We, you know, atoned um, with our parents, with our teachers, with you know, with, with our God, if there's a God, whatever. We worked all that stuff out in private, and um, we just started wondering if our, our child, now we have two kids, would have that same luxury. Um, and we thought perhaps they wouldn't. And that's what started rattling through my brain. That's what got under my skin in Dave's book, and I knew that I wanted to make it as a film. Hmm. Um, unsurveiled, is that a word? Unsurveilled? <laughs> Unsurveilled? I have to ask. Have you just coined something new. I might have made that word up. I, I, uh, I'm it not. It sounds like a word that's going to become part of our <laughs> regular lexicon. Like that'll be in the OED yeah. in a few years. Yeah. yeah. Unsurveilled. Oh, I have chosen to be unsurveilled. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Can you choose to be unsurveilled? What if that becomes the thing after the millennials, the cool thing to be to... To, in other words, that's the next step of oh no, I have no social online presence. Yeah, I'm actually that would be, be great, new, Jack. That would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah, we would fight for that one. <laughs> um, so on uh, on your character and you personally, um, yes. you've been a huge advocate for diversity, not just in technology but in in all industry and specifically he for she. You want to yes. speak a little bit about that and just where you're going through in this in this movie and you know, mm. was there a did it make it more real? or was it you know, just uh, accepted? Yeah, um, you know, I think currently 18% uh, of computer science graduates are women. And you know, I mean, the tech industry notoriously has issues with diversity. So to be the female face <coughs> of, you know, in our movie, hypothetically the biggest tech company in the world um, was really interesting. And I think, um, you know, there was a lot about May and Eamon's kind of relationship and, and the power play there that I think um, made that relationship really complex and, and really tense. Um, 
And yeah, I think that, uh, you know, um, Twitter is actually one of our Heath She uh, impact champions <laughs> by coincidence. Um, and I know that that's something that uh, as a company, you've been trying to trying to tackle that problem. And um, I know that particularly within leadership roles, that's something that you've been mm -hmm. trying to push is to try to kind of, you know, move the needle, um, I think. 22% of your leadership roles are female, and I think you've moved it up to something like, you've moved it up by 6% in the mm -hmm. last year, which mm -hmm. is amazing. Um, but uh, obviously still more to do. But um, why was this an issue that you think that Twitter wanted to tackle? Like, you know, why was this an, a problem that was personally important to, well, to, I, I mean, to your company? Yeah, first and foremost, like we, we want to build a service that um, is accessible to anyone. And mm -hmm. We need uh, we need different perspectives to understand how or why not it's it's not accessible to someone, not approachable to someone. So we benefit, you know, pretty dramatically from having different perspectives within the company, different ways of thinking, different backgrounds, different context, um, and from people all over the world. And if we can't have that insight, we we certainly can't present that externally as well. We can't we can't build something for our our customer. Um, if we don't understand who they are and we don't live that way every single day. So um, we, we saw an opportunity not just to change, you know, change the ratio, but also hold ourselves accountable to it very publicly. So we were one of the first companies to actually share our goals, not just mm -hmm. where we are, but what we're trying to get to. Um, because it is something that not only we have to address, but our industry has to address and other industries have to address as well. And I think there's been a big focus certainly on um, more technical roles in engineering, but, mm -hmm. but just focusing on leadership in particular. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my focus has been our board, uh, the leadership team uh, at the at the top of the company. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's really important for people to be able to see you know what they can aspire to be, and mm -hmm. uh, to understand that you know this is a person that's extremely well accomplished, comes from a background similar to mine. I can be there too, and uh, having a conversation with them uh, of what it took, mm -hmm. working backwards from mm -hmm. that is is really important. So our focus has has been there, but I I think you know the 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 more important is is not just diversity but uh, inclusion as mm -hmm. well, and making sure that we're building a environment that helps everyone feel welcome, helps everyone feel that they can thrive, helps everyone feel that they can set a bar for themselves in terms of their skill level uh, sure. of what they want to do. We've had people join the company as a supporter and have aspirations to become an engineer or a designer and having that sort of internal um, path and mobility and, and just an option is also really important because I think we focus a lot in our industry and certainly elsewhere on the people we don't have how to get them in mm -hmm. versus the people we do have and how to how to grow them. So we've been putting a lot more emphasis on the people we do have and, and uh, how do we build a more inclusive environment which will have an end result of creating more diversity of, um, of, of gender, of race, of sexual preference, but also of ideology so that we're really <coughs> understanding all perspectives. Sure. That's awesome. I don't want to sound naive. It just, it, I, I am, I, I can almost understand why a lot of the pre-information age industries did have a lack of diversity because it was from this other age, but especially information and tech, wouldn't you just want to draw outside of any kind of social boundaries the absolute best you can, you know what I mean? Like the absolute best you can get for whatever project you're working on. So I'm just wondering where, where that holdover came from. Was it just a generational thing that was kind of there as an echo or is it just, is it actually a, are we not as advanced as we'd like to think that we are? Do you, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if that's if, if that's still a, a thing that's being addressed, it just feels odd that it's being addressed in 2017. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure actually. I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure what the, what the causes are. I, I think um, some of it probably comes down to location and where a lot of these things started and, and uh, and, and just holding on to that particular locale versus like really broadening out. Right. Um, but uh, it's, uh, I, you know, I think first just acknowledging it and then like what are the most tangible steps that we can take, we can actually build into our DNA and our practice every single day. Right. Um, has, has been our, our focus, but it's a good question. Yeah. We actually have a 
video that I think is going to play now that it kind of is on this topic while we're just discussing it. May and Bailey, well, it sort of, it starts out as employer-employee and it becomes, I would say, one of those very complicated patriarchal relationships where Bailey takes on a kind of father figure sort of role with her, but of course is her employer at the end of the day. So um, it's a very, it becomes a very complex relationship. Um, yeah. So, so there you have it. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> no need to be having this interview now. Um, we can just watch this clip. Um, yeah, uh, I love playing May. She's, um, she is so complex. Um, everything that you said about being incredibly idealistic, I feel like one of May's big problems is that she really believes in the perfect solution um, to, to these problems. She really believes that there is kind of one answer that if we all pull together, you know, we can get there. And um, she doesn't realize it, but her approach is quite extreme in the end and quite sort of totalitarian almost. Um, she, she kind of becomes her own charming little um, dictator, I think, without realizing that she's, that she's headed there. Um, and, you know, but with, with such good intentions, and I think that's what you and I were so drawn to all the time, was that she, yeah, she had these incredibly good, is coming from a good place, um, but kind of ultimately, ultimately very warped, warped vision and way of, way of getting there. She definitely um, comes from a generation who aspire to be disruptors. Yeah. Right. And I think um, I think we generally see that as a as a good thing. Disruption is can disrupt the status quo. But we've yes. also clearly seen um, in in the past year how people can come in from a from a different industry and um, and and affect the world negatively in politics, whatever it is, and disrupt things. And it doesn't always work out the way we think it is. That's yes. certainly the case. For May, but she does have good intentions. She's very idealistic. Yeah. And she's just looking for her, her place to make her mark. I remember for you and I, like, you know, we, we obviously made the, the movie before the election. And, uh, yeah, what. Oh, yeah, remember that. Yeah, yeah. remember that. Yeah. But that watching the election, we were like, wow, this is, it feels like everything that we're touching on in this movie is playing out in front of our eyes, you know, just months after we. we you know, called cut and wrapped on that movie, and um, that was that was really remarkable for me. I felt like you know, um, life, art, reality, all kind of coming together. And I think uh, there's stuff that we predicted that I really wish we hadn't predicted. predicted. Accurately. <laughs> yeah. I wish we'd gotten a yeah. way more stuff wrong. Yeah, that would have been <laughs> nice. That would have been cool. Um, <laughs> That would have been really cool. <laughs> um, Pat, you've been using uh, Twitter for ages. You're yeah, one of the first, on, right? I, I, don't, I, don't, I wasn't the first guy. Uh, <laughs> the first ever Twitter I, user, Pat. I was one of the MVP. <laughs> there, there was a whole bunch of us that were like trying to, again, play with it. It's a very fun, um, it, it, it's, it's almost, the, what's so great about it is it's purely verbal and, and if you know how to use verbiage and really play with it, you can really get people to um, kind of sit up and take notice. And especially if you're using it towards, okay, I'm going to be funny and entertaining and then use that to point the camera towards this issue or, you know, this problem that I would like people to maybe look at. And, and it's, you know, and, and, it, and it gives people um, uh, a, a doorway that would normally, it, it's, it, it it is what the Ramones did. That's how I always think of it. Of in the early '70s, of these giant bands, where it's like you can't be in rock and roll unless you have a fog machine and lasers and a huge dragon that comes out. And the Ramones are like, no, you can just plug into amps and play quickly and and grab people. And that's sort of what Twitter did. It, it just shaved that the best everything. Comparison I've ever heard. You can put that on your marketing material. The Ramones were a rock and roll band. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks, Tom. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate yeah, that. But I mean, th th really quickly, the, the <laughs> internet was getting to a point where websites that n what got attention had bells and whistles and animation, and then it's like, no, what about just really plangent ideas that, bang, hit people in the forehead, and that's what 
Twitter was. Let's watch a commercial for another a, a bit of uh, the, the circle right now. For the, <laughs> next, for the next 32 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> this circle is a problem that we cannot solve. We have cameras all over the world right now. This Friday. Where does all that data go? The deeper you go. I'm the only one who can do this. The darker it gets. I want the truth. You can't trust anyone. The circle. Rated PG-13. Even Bailey is one of the three founding fathers of uh, the circle. He is the visionary, the idea man, uh, not the financial guy and not the tech guy. He's the guy who dreams big. Yeah, so yeah, <clears throat> so I play the guy in the movie. You know that he's a diabolical genius because he has a beard. Do you find that to be the case? <laughs> That in order for everybody to know that, is there a diabolical genius in the room? Oh, it must be the guy in the beard. Oh, you're getting there yourself. Um, but the, 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 the thing about the, playing the guy in charge is, is he's the guy that had this idea of the way things should be. <clears throat> we should have no secrets, thinks um, Eamon Bailey. We should all be unified. We should all be able to communicate instantaneously. And, you know, we, sh we should also not have to rely on keeping things secret or relying on our own anonymity. Because the more things are out there, the more transparent everything is. And thus, the human condition is improved and we reach a state of nirvana. Now, how does that happen technologically? Well, you trust the, the geniuses who can write the code and, and invent the machines to come up with, with that kind of stuff. So that allows <clears throat> the diabolical genius that, that, uh, that uh, Eamon is, uh, along with, uh, uh, with Mr. Uh, uh, Stanton, yes, uh, in, order to, <laughs> in order to then take that idea and push it one step, one step further. There's a scene in the movie in which we're just sitting around. Uh, we have this thing called the Gang of 40, which is the original 40 people that got together, and it's mm -hmm. like this. In order to crack the, game of, the Gang of 40, you've got to be really... You got to be high up in the circle. You got to be really smart. You got to be very aggressive. And we're talking about the concept of how to make the numbers of the people who are members of the circle equal the numbers of people who voted in the last election. Because there's actually more members of the circle than there are people who took part in the democratic process. And so the, 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 the spitballing, the, the, the dreaming that goes on is, well, there must be a way. And lo and behold, May herself is the one that comes up with this way that is such an actually great, fantastic idea. Mm. But when you carry it to its actual conclusion and its mm -hmm. effect on human nature is no different than what the Stasi did in East Germany. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <clears throat> this concept of keeping track of everybody and saying, you do, in fact, have to vote. And that comes around to this other concept that anybody who runs a company, yeah, whether you're, whether you're uh, you know, a tech company or if you make a baby buggies, would love it if everybody who had a baby was forced to own one of your baby buggies. <laughs> it would just be the greatest thing for the bottom line. It'd be the greatest thing for the design process. It'd be the greatest thing for your, for your uh, employees. And it would be wonderful for the babies themselves because mm. they would have the best baby buggy. But out inside that comes some degree of malevolent totalitarianism or, or dictum that removes all these things such as choice or or in the case of the word that we coined earlier, un, uh, 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 unsurveilled. 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 You know, all unsurveilled. you have to do in order to give in to the great promise of the circle is to agree to be surveilled. Mm. That's all you have to do. And your life will be magnificent and easy and fast and quick. And you'll always have somebody to go kayaking with. And you'll <laughs> never be, you'll never be, uh, be suffering from a parent with multiple sclerosis ever again. There'll be a support system. All that. But you will be surveilled to a mm. point. I mean, that's taking it to a, almost a scientifically dystopian um, uh, vision of it. And the question then is, well, what if you choose to be unsurveilled? And is it possible to be... Is the opt-out possible? Yeah. And, is and will there be some kind of benign way to stop you being unsurveilled? Why do you want to be unsurveilled? Why, it, like, you what know, do you have to hide? You what are you guilty a, of? You what have, have you a done? baby. Wouldn't you want to have the best baby <laughs> buggy that's ever been invented that yeah. can keep track of you? So the, it, it mm. ends up being this on... This, the, 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 what Dave did, I think we can all agree in the book, is that what Dave Eggers did. And he, he took the all of this magnificent promise of, of ease and uh, the dream of... Uh, that technology has certainly delivered to us in many, many ways, and taken it to its most 
the furthest extreme that is not one of artificial intelligence taking over our control of us, but actually our own individual choices co-opting us out of the, the grand code of like <clears throat> uh, indifference <clears throat> and, and chaos that is actually part of the human condition and part of the, uh, yeah. part of, uh, uh, part of the universe. Now, this is a responsibility that like, like Twitter has put us exactly in the middle of everything from up, you know, the, the Arab Spring uh, to uh, the, the present, uh, president of the United States, States uh, three o'clock in the morning ramblings. <clears throat> one is fantastic. The other one is goofy, <laughs> you know, yeah. odd. So it you get- It may be a little scary. Well, <laughs> you know, you know, if you choose to be scared by it, it can be, you know, if you decide to take it, you know, seriously and, uh, and uh, literally, yeah, it can be. <laughs> uh, but in the, in the grand scheme of things, I, you know, Steve Martin <clears throat> published a book about not only his tweets, but the responses to his tweets. And I said, that's right. well, that's like a retro technology, <laughs> isn't it? You wrote tweets, people responded to it, and you printed it on paper in a book you can only buy <laughs> either on Amazon or in a bookstore. So uh, it ends up being this, this, uh, this, this still grand ball of possibility that is, on one hand, certainly your option, certainly a, a, a series of choices, but once you, I think, enjoy one of the benefits, or uh, six of the benefits that all of technology can, can, can give to you, you might then be also opting into that, <clears throat> that, that, that un, un, uh, 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 unobserved, unanonymous realm that, you know, you, you, that is what the, the, the tech world is, is, that really does run on. Uh, one of the things that, <clears throat> that we talked about that is not really said in the movie is actually pretty great. It's like, look, if everybody knows everybody's <clears throat> secrets, no one needs to be ashamed because your secret makes you ashamed, mine makes me ashamed. Once we know them all, because your secret, I don't care about that. So it can be actually quite liberating. All you have to do to decide is to never have another secret. <laughs> and <clears throat> I'm not sure. And then we're in 1984. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then do you have nothing but constant uh, identification with who you are, which means you can never be anonymous again? I'm not sure anybody never wants to be anonymous again. So yeah. it is it, it, much like, you know, when, when those guys invented that printing press that could print out books, they were unleashing this concept in order to, to tell the truth, to bring beauty to the world, to enlighten anybody who reads it, or print lies, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, prints, you know, make, make books that would steal people the wrong way and actually... Uh, 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 do a do a great disservice to the to the human condition. So we end up seeing being on the same kind of like uh, precipice of possibility. You know, I made this old movie when you were when you were very young. You might have seen it when your parents were. When not. I was a fetus. So, yeah, well, you might have like we're going. We're, Mom and Dad are going out. We've rented. You've got mail, so you can watch it again. Oh, stop and it! I love that I don't movie. know how old you are. <laughs> It's a talk. The thing we had then was that even, <laughs> even right then, we had this thing of which you had to send an email to somebody. But inside that email between myself and, and Meg Ryan was this great promise of romance and happiness and, and love at last and a connection that you couldn't get any other way. But it was old technology. You had to send an email. And it was also based on anonymity. What you do, Twitter, now you can communicate with the entire world with that same yeah. brand of promise and potentially that same brand of anonymity, although if you're really cool, you actually will say who you are, so you're not hiding behind anything, but when you do that, you might be opening yourself up to all sorts of other contexts that you're not asking for. So it's odd, we're in, we're the, 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 the techno technological triumph that we've all been able to experience uh, has, has us in that same exact place, except it can happen much, much quicker and uh, it can go around the world. I know even as we are joking now, thousands of people are watching us on this live feed. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say there's, I'm gonna say there's 6,250 people watching us right now. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you can either add zeros onto that or, or, mm -hmm. or not. Um, and that is an absolute magnificent reality, no matter what you wanna sell. A movie like The Circle that we're all very <laughs> proud of, but we could be selling something 
you know, ridiculously malevolent if we wanted to, and we'd be using the we'd be using the same exact technology. So it comes down to some degree of uh, personal responsibility. But again, the guy with the beard sits around, and I, 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 this is this is how I, I played you. I played you. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm I'm not in as good a shape. I didn't exercise or eat as well as you did, but I played you. And uh, it, it, it was a, a, a sitting around saying, well, how can we make the world better? I mean, at the end of the day, I think most of this is like not how well, making a buck is wonderful, but it starts with some aspect of how can we draw people together? How can we make what's going on in their world as prescient as a, and as immediate to our to ourselves, who are thousands of miles away in a, in a complete uh, culture that's completely removed. Um, but you know, you can uh, you don't have to go back very far of this because one of the things that Eamon talks about with our sea change cameras is that hey, injustice is not going to be able to hide as well as it has been able to. And there are people out there with a Twitter account who are bringing just injustice to light. And that's incredibly, incredibly important to the human condition. And we just hope that 51% of the world's population <laughs> does that. Because that's 2% more than the 49% that will be, that will be spreading lies. Right. So uh, the founding goals of the circle compared to real life. I'm not purple. Are you purple? <laughs> I'm turquoise, my friend. Are uh, you purple? So are we, are we don't purple. even have to throw to another clip now. We don't. Oh, you know, here. For the next, <laughs> oh, listen to this. You've got 15 seconds of joy coming your way. We have a TV spot that lasts 15 seconds. So here's some more content from, from the circle. Back to the circle. Knowing is good, but knowing everything is better. It's only the things we hide that get us in trouble. Everyone is talking about the most provocative thriller of the year. Is there anything you want to tell us? Emma Watson. I'm the only one who can do this. Tom Hanks. You think this was just a camera? John Boyega. You can't trust anyone. It shouldn't have happened. The Circle is watching. The Circle, rated PG-13. Sharing is caring um, uh, at, at face value is a, is a delightful uh, phrase and, and a wonderful kind of mantra for how to live your life. Uh, but in the terms of The Circle, sharing is caring uh, gets mutated um, to the point where, you know, you, you are, it is assumed you will share everything. But without boundaries, you get eaten alive. Hi, Twitter. <laughs> Put your pants back on. We're back. Um, here's the, uh, wow, uh, yeah, a data-driven world. A lot of stuff that, it's amazing how a lot of the stuff that, that Tom was just talking about, um, with, without changing the, the way he said it, could be beneficial or sinister in the exact same sentence. And I think now, especially, there, there, there seem to be a, especially watching my daughter grow up, there is a generation of kids that are very comfortable with and already assume they're just being watched all the time. Because mm. um, they're used to seeing other people either on YouTube or on TV, not interacting, but addressing a lens and a faceless multitude. And, you know, the, the character that I play, Stenton, I think, and this is, I think this exists in tech, I think this existed in industry beforehand, there is a section of the population that is way more comfortable not talking to people face to face, but rather through memos and directives or... Texts. Yeah, texts and, um, uh, you know, uh, a lens. And so, you know, how, again, there are, good, it, it helps a lot of introverts get their message out there, and it especially helped people that maybe have problems with uh, um, social anxiety and stuff like that to, you know, create an identity in the world. But I think it also disconnects people from a lot of the uh, consequences and effects of what they are doing, and, and it can lead to some pretty harmful actions <coughs> taking place because it doesn't feel like you're doing it to some, to another person, you know. So that's something that, well, there's a, and I don't want to give too much away, but there's a, there's a great thing that you do in the that Emma does when she decides to go transparent. Can I say that she decides to go transparent? It's a big part of it. And there's a weird. It's like it, it's an it's an acting choice that you make, but it's like you become an amplified version of yourself without realizing you're doing it. And mm -hmm. it, yes, it amplifies you, but just like a car that's running on nitro, it's also kind of burning you out a little bit. And and so I'm just wondering. 
if there's going to be, if we're going to see a, an effect, I guess, in society's behavior that we can't see right now because it's just now starting. But in 10 years, are there going to be people that are so burned out by this that they that, that there'll be some kind of mass retreat from? It, it'll be the opposite of Andy Warhol saying, and in the future, mm -hmm. everyone will be allowed to be anonymous for 15 minutes, <laughs> yeah. and then you'll be pushed <laughs> back <laughs> out in front of your, you know. <laughs> if, if, if this was 1984, <laughs> Big Brother... Or go eat cheese in hotels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Big Brother would be on the TV for the two-minute hate going, please stop sending me pictures of your privates. I don't, mm. I don't know why we put the cameras in you guys' apartment. You people are nuts. Uh, we, you know, so it, it, it is... It, it's the classic, you know, there's three science fiction plots. What if, if only, and if this goes on. And this is the oh. classic, if only, dot, 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 but then it goes way too far. But you don't realize it's happening because everyone, especially Eamon, especially May, are so positive and excited and are only seeing the benefits but not the responsibilities. And so that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out in real life, I think. Like the if only of the sort of archetypal sort of speculative or sci-fi plots. Like yes. I, I think what we anticipated in like fiction of the 50s and 60s or like paranoid conspiracy films of the 70s yeah. was that the government would steal our information from us, that we should p be paranoid of the government and maybe that's justified. But the, the irony of modern living is that sort of the panopticon, like the self-regulating regulating society that we have is one where we've voluntarily ceded our private information for just the ease of, <clears throat> of a right. good like if, if we live in a neighborhood and we saw an unmarked black car with a bunch of radar dishes slowly moving <laughs> down the street with a radar dish pointing at all our house, we would be outraged and we wouldn't know who's driving that black car. But if it says Google on the side of it, we just say, oh, it's just making a map of the house. Yeah, That's exactly. its own. It's a, it's yeah. a, or if it said Twitter on the side of it. We would we would be so overjoyed we would tweet out. Uh, I feel yeah. lucky. I live in a Twitter yeah. neighborhood now. People would run outside naked. Hey, yeah. woo! Do you, do you ever do that just on the on the off chance that satellites are photographing your house at the just time? Just kind of go out and dance around. Did you see the photograph of Earth that was that there's the Cassini uh, 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 probe took from inside the uh, the rings of Saturn? It was just on it. Literally, it's a, there's a probe, and it turned around. It took a picture through the rings of Saturn of this little dot that is the planet Earth. And I wanted to find out exactly <laughs> when that picture was taken so I could say, well, here's a picture of me taking a shower before I went to work that day, because that's what I was doing. That, uh, that, that, that's, 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 that, that is that big that's, data, my that's friend. That's big data. You, a a <laughs> photograph data. of the entire Earth, that is well, some big data. It's so weird. You're talking about big data. When you watch these paranoid 70s films, Parallax View, All the President's Men, Three Days of the Condor, Colossus the Forbin Colossus, Project. Colossus the Forbin Project. Yeah. Where that's the first movie where someone uh, goes clear. We are now sitting in this the geek the section <laughs> of, the, yeah. of, the, of the... I'm on this side. I was one, put on this side. There's a wonderful movie called The Matrix. <laughs> yeah. And they, do, they, they go into the computer. Yeah. It's crazy. It's nuts. But they, in those movies, they're digging for one tiny scrap of information. Nowadays, it's the opposite. You're digging through mountains of information to figure out what's pertinent and what isn't. It's not a lack of information. It's we're being flooded with it and mm -hmm. trying to get oxygen in the middle of it to figure out what's real and what isn't. That's what that's the dilemma we're facing now. But the other hand of that is like, man, you need an answer to a question, you know, of something that is perplexing well, and you've got it in a in a in a minute and a half, less than a minute and a half, yeah. depending on your you know, whether you've uh, got, you know, 3G or 4G. Yeah, it's an extraordinary gift. At the same time, it can be an extraordinary curse. Big data. Yeah. I've had, I remember a friend of mine was online saying, there's this movie, it's guys in motorcycle helmets with skulls, and then George Sanders is in it. And people, Psychorama, and like they immediately found, like you could find things now by giving weird general descriptions, and somebody out there will know what you're talking about mm. oh. in the arts or something. Although could, I don't, I don't imagine Woodward and Bernstein going uh, something with uh, uh, burglars and then uh, plumbers. But oh yeah, it's remember, the, they, they the, remember. Okay, <laughs> there was a movie called uh, All the President's Men. Uh, 
we, we rag on Emma so much because she's she's 14 years old, or will be forever because mm -hmm. of the choices you've made yeah, in your yeah. career. Sorry. So there's that there's one scene where Woodward and Bernstein are going through the card catalog in the Library yes. of Congress. It's one of the greatest shots in motion picture history, where the camera just comes up and up and up and up and up, and they're just going through. Well, you know, a Google search now. The, uh, if Alan Pakula was alive and, and to made to try to make a dynamic shot of the Google search, <laughs> Dustin Hoff wouldn't be doing like this in his car. Yeah. Oh, uh, Z uh, Zapruder. He's there got, you know, it'd be like that fast. Not exactly the same cinematic possibility. Well, there's a scene, there's also a scene in that movie, and my dad told me about this when he first saw it in the theater. Oh, how old are you? Remember, well, I'm still pretty old. Okay. But he right. saw, you know, remember they're looking for um, Dal Kenneth H. Dahlberg? Yes, yeah. And they go into a room in the Washington Post where they have every yellow pages from the country. That was their Google. But apparently at the time when they, when people saw that scene, my dad remembers people going, whoa, they've got every <laughs> yellow page. This oh, is like a nerve crazy. center. And, the, and there's people just going through the, looking for Dahlberg in every single yellow page in the country. It was oh. hilarious. Yeah, right. that, that was the internet back then. I mean, but I think of like the end of the conversation, like the last images of Gene Hackman ripping <laughs> apart the floorboards, yep. trying to search out the truth and it being sort of unknowable and him as, what, it's an image of going nuts. I mean, I, when I thought of, when I read Dave's book and I thought of May, once she goes transparent, becomes oh. a public figure, and then tries to keep up with everyone who wants to comment on everything she's doing, whether she wants to just be connected, everyone be generous, give of herself, be mm. totally connected in a very mm. pseudo spiritual way. It, it's mad. It's, it's so much maddening. watching that. Yeah. That was something I wanted to speak to as well, which was when you mentioned this kind of like amped up version of herself that May becomes when she takes the decision to become transparent. Mm -hmm. when, to be transparent in our movie means that. May agrees to be watched all the time throughout her, you know, every single second of her daily life. Um, and I remember James directing me and saying, you know, like more, more, more. And playing the version of May that was being watched all the time was exponentially more exhausting yeah. than playing the version of May who was just kind of interacting in a way that when she wasn't being watched. And it's interesting because I recently just obviously did this press tour for Beauty and the Beast and. I guess it's kind of like, it's on my mind, but I did, um, I did uh, Jimmy Kimmel, where he makes you read the, uh, oh, the mean the tweets. Mean tweet. <laughs> and it made me realize as I was doing it, I was like, wow, you know, it's being asked of me and it's being asked of my um, contempt, you know, my friends, everyone around me to be so much more resilient than I think we've ever had to be in the sense that usually if someone's saying something unkind about you, they're saying it behind your back, conveniently, right. quietly, in a whisper in another room. But the world that we live in now, with the level of transparency that we're seeing, you know, kids are getting, ev you get everything. Every, every unkind Constantly. word, every criticism, every Jack, what, whatever else. Jack, what does it do to you to hear us referencing mean tweets? <laughs> 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 you don't know? But no, but I just realized, like, Annie in our movie, she burns out. I mean, in yes, the most it's amazing. profound One of the most way. realistic things. She has yeah. nothing left. And that's, that's what being, like, on, 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 all the time kind of does for you, and the ability or the, not to be able to opt out, not to be able to say, I just need to like, I don't know, wear sweatpants and like pick my nose and like do all the things <laughs> that I wouldn't normally do for like a few days. I think it's like that level can just drive you crazy, crazy, crazy. Well, I mean, this is sort of a meta question, but I mean, May in the beginning of the story is relatively anonymous and then midway yeah. through she gains some level of celebrity. I mean. Yeah. I imagine the three of you like have a much thicker skin about such things than say I do. Mm. Like, what do you think it would be like for the average person to suddenly <laughs> just to go out and get a turkey sandwich? It would be like for, being on a press but, junket for Beauty and the Beast for the yeah. rest of your life. But that's what's so crazy is I feel like it's yeah. becoming so much more relatable because yeah. it's not like fame isn't something that just celebrities are experiencing anymore. To a yeah. certain degree, everyone who uses social media or has a social media platform or whatever else is broadcasting themselves, marketing themselves, sharing intimate details of their lives and to us, and you know they're receiving comment, they're receiving likes, dislikes, like you know on a they're experiencing exactly what I'm experiencing. It, of course to lesser and greater degrees, but like you know it's um it's the way that the world is moving like my experiences I don't feel like are unique so much anymore in a really interesting way. 
Yeah, fame isn't really being achieved anymore. It's being inflicted on people. <laughs> I mean, really, there's people that fame is just being inflicted on because of uh, social media. You, when, you, you can sort of decide to be famous now. Y yeah, you can just go, I'm going to be famous tomorrow. Yeah, you, and it's very, very easy. When was that inflection you know, point for you, though? <clears throat> the which part? When was that inflection point for you? When, when did it shift from more of the traditional media to... Uh, I think for me, it was when I got on Twitter and started realizing, uh, I, I mean, if I, if I want a really basic way to describe it, suddenly the, the, my stand-up shows sold out very quickly and very easily, and people after the show would come up and talk to me about tweets I'd sent out as if we were having a conversation that had been interrupted and now we're resuming it. It was a different kind of energy speaking to people. And a lot of times that was really good. They felt like they knew me more and, and it was, you know, easier to talk about things, but then there was also a a, a weird feeling of ownership sometimes, or or of, of a hey, I said something to you and you never responded. And I'm like, well, because I, I can't like read every response. I have to go live a life so that I can have material to do comedy. You know, so there was a some moments of I, I've had some weird moments on Twitter, but for the for the most part, it's been very very fun. Don't. Shut down my account. Um, but, um, uh, that's not possible. <laughs> yeah, that is not possible. Didn't didn't Louis C.K. tweet about Tignatara when she was actually on stage at Largo? As he was watching it happen. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe I'm seeing this right now. She said Tignataro is crushing it right now at Largo, and yeah. it altered the life of Tignataro yeah. and, 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 and in a in a magnificent in way. In a great way. Yeah. Check out this exclusive clip. No, it's that turquoise. It's mine. Oh, I'm sorry. That. That's you. I'm <laughs> turquoise. I just can't help but try to be the the host of the morning breakfast show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, after this clip, I want to talk to you about an idea. But before we do, is there anything you want to tell us? That I've been here before. It's only our lies that get us in trouble. The things we hide. Of course, I know you've been in here before. <laughs> <laughs> and now that I know your secret, do you feel better or worse? Better. Relieved, actually. I am a believer in the perfectibility of human beings. When we are our best selves, the possibilities are endless. There isn't a problem that we cannot solve. We can cure any disease and we can end hunger and without secrets, without the hoarding of knowledge and information, we can finally realize our potential. Hey, we are back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? Uh, are you so excited? We are yeah. back. <laughs> We're still here. Yeah. We've been here. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, um, I was thinking recently in the news, we've seen sort of incidences of, um, of sort of people take, taking the platform of social media, live streaming, um, in really tragic directions. Obviously, there's many instances of people using it in positive ways, and I'm just sort of curious uh, for all of you, um, just sort of how, what you feel your responsibility <laughs> is to sort of have an online presence um, and to mm. share of yourself or what you feel doesn't have to be shared. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the biggest thing that technology can do in the positive or negative is just change the velocity of something. So um, I think that, you know, that can go very negative very quickly mm. or, or it can also, you can also try to understand where someone might need help, where someone might need support, and um, offer solutions and present solutions much faster. So this is obviously a complicated problem that we don't fully understand yet because the technology is so new. I mean, just the ability to see someone live halfway around the world and, and actually see their perspective through their own eyes um, presents entirely new experiences and entirely new new challenges and because it's happening in real time uh, you know it's it's not something that we've ever really had to address or, or solve before but I you know I think with a positive intent of uh, if we if we can create greater venue for people to offer support faster uh, to provide resources of, of help um, if you if you do have more negative leaning uh, thoughts or um, taking a negative impact um, to just change the mindset and try to use the the crowd and the support structure that you may have around you to uh, to influence 
a, a different a different sort of outcome. But it's it's new, and we have to learn really really quickly. But I do I do think we can't just be tool makers here. I think we need to make sure that we are advocating for um, positive usage of it, realizing that you know there will be negative, and um, the faster we can learn from that and understand uh, where the appropriate time is to help and and how to help, um, we get better. So just have to make it a priority. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, the one thing I learned, especially during the election, is maybe don't so much put your face and name behind things, put your platform behind something that you want to shine light on, an artist or a community activist. I, I remember I was at Sundance during the Women's March, and I realized, well, if I'm out there sending selfies of me, there's people are going to go, yeah, celebrity in Park City, whatever. And I, and I saw a lot of people trying to write off the Women's March by going, it's just L.A. and New York. So you could, I could retweet, here's Boise, here's Charleston. Here, like, it was way bigger, and it's not this just exclusive East Coast. It, it was everywhere. It was Chicago. So, and, and I was seeing a lot of people doing that, and that's what made it, I think it landed with so much more impact, was that you could, you could immediately erase the lie of, eh, you know, coastal elites, like, no, it's not. It's literally everywhere, and here's proof it's happening right now. So that's a great way to use, to me, to use social media, is put light on stuff that you want to, you know, have more attention brought to. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's been amazing, you know, working with the He For She campaign to see how social media can put out ideas that can really change people's thought processes and and evoke a completely different kind of connection and empathy to a certain issue and you know just in the last four months we've had 115,000 conversations on Twitter using the hashtag he for she and um, and I and I've seen it making a tangible difference I've, I've, I've really I've I've witnessed that so I think um, it's uh, as we've been saying, you know, social media technology, it's a kind of amplifier in a way. It's a, it's a, it's a really, really powerful megaphone that can, that can be used for good or ill. And it, the, the kind of internet and, and technology is kind of this, it's like kind of like the Wild West right now. And, and, and everyone's trying to figure out how to sort of get a handle on or try to govern this kind of ungovernable force to keep people safe but also to make sure that we're not restricting freedoms and, and civil liberties. Um, so it's a, yeah, I just, I love and I'm just so proud of this film because it just tackles so much of that head on. And um, I think it, it, it touches so many aspects of, of everyone's lives. I think this film is relevant to absolutely everyone, really. I mean, we know that over half of the world now are internet users. More than half the world use telephones and can have internet on their phones. This this really pertains to to just a massive, massive demographic of, of the world. It still sort of comes down to um, a personal, individual bent that is as different as there are people in the world. Do you do you look to all of this for enlightenment? to help you understand things you do not understand? Or do you look to it for confirmation of things you already believe and accept as to be true? Because I, <clears throat> like, you know, there was that just despicable aspect of Pizzagate, you know, the pizza parlor yeah. in suburban Washington. And I am sure that there were tweets that came out that said, this is nonsense. <laughs> this guy is selling pizzas. Yeah. But you, I don't recall any of those being brought to the forefront or being as nearly as uh, prompting of action as were the absolute false ones that went out. This is, it comes down to we are goofy, imperfect, ungovernable uh, species. Um, we are unpredictable and we seem to, uh, to uh, we are attracted to various different sort of flames like moths. Mm. And is that flame something that uh, enlightens the cave or is it a flame that burns the house down? <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, in that case, it's just a, it's as individual as our own DNA and our own fingerprints, how you, how you take to the entire great, uh, 
the great uh, technological world is uh, is really bent on what our what our own motivations are. And I have to ask you really quickly one thing. Hit, hit me. Has anyone ever got back to you about whether or not they have found a missing glove? <laughs> you know, this yeah. is how Tom uses his that's, social that's, media. Uh, if you post gloves and shoes and odd socks, have, but you, only singles. have, any, have they been reunited? Yeah. This is what I need to know. My, my deep, deep seated fantasy is that yes, someone <laughs> has said, that's my glove. And they go right back to the corner of wherever it was it taken was. And, uh, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they pick Why it up. Why did you think to start doing that? Well, because whenever I would see, it started with like gloves, but also like little baby shoes and booties. And I said, that's a story. That's a story of, you know, someone got home to their apartment and said, oh, I lost my glove. Can I afford another glove? That was a great, you know. Or the little baby says, why is the baby crying? Oh, my God, her foot's freezing because her booty fell off. I'm going to do the in breakfast the show host thing and say that that is all we have time for, folks. <laughs> and thank you so much for tuning in and for listening. And uh, our movie opens this Friday. If you'd like to go and see it. Um, Here comes Donna with the traffic. Yes, and the weather report. <laughs> it's, following, it's following now. Thanks, Jack, for hosting the, uh, the Thank, yeah, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Super thank cool. You.